Greetings, everyone. We welcome you to today's Libra Solar Festival with Michael Linfield um, on behalf of the 2025 Initiative Coordination Group. It's um, good to be gathering again today in the full power and potency of the Libra full moon. We'll begin today's um, meeting with a brief alignment. This is clear in New Zealand, by the way. <laughs> so we come together today in gratitude for this time together and in appreciation of each other. Friends, kindred souls, co-workers. Bringing our focus to the present moment we set aside our day's concerns and distractions and settle into a space of receptivity and quiet. Using our creative imaginations, we visualize all of us linking together in a sacred circle, each of us joining the group from our different location on the planet. Together we become a station of light. Our individual lights brightening as we come together in this group formation. Visualizing the current world situation as best we can, we see the purifying light from the great spiritual and cosmic lives that watch over us and guide our planetary evolution, streaming towards humanity and merging with the light already present on Earth and within humanity's breaking open heart. We see the loving energy, the rays, their potencies and the clarifying forces that are available, available to us during this Libra full moon period, pouring through the center of our circle and streaming into the hearts and minds of all humanity. Love connects us in this group. It underlies our purpose and is at the heart of the work we aspire to do together. We affirm the intentions of the 2025 initiative to create with you and with each other a safe and vitalized container for the exchange of questions, inspiration and ideas that support each other's learning and that are congruent with the steady outworking of the plan. Michael, today we thank you for the material you've prepared for us on the subject of the Ninth Seed Group, the financiers and economists. May we listen and learn with the air of the heart. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. And welcome to our gathering of co-workers. I'm in the hills of Umbria in the heart of Italy, and there's a very strong windstorm blowing at the moment. So occasionally there may be some disruption to the Wi-Fi connectivity. If by chance that should happen, please just hold the field and reflect on whatever theme we were focused on. And then when I return, if I am disappeared for a while, then we will just continue in a seamless way. So we, we will work with the elements and we'll work with the energy that's flowing. So there's a, a lot of wind blowing around here in Umbria. So the focus is on the ninth seed group of financiers and economists. And I wanted to approach this 
through three different lenses, three different perspectives. So let me just share with you, and we're going to use images on the screen to depict these three lenses. So the first lens that we'll look at is the energetic universe of self. We're going to look at the law of divine economy, the circulation of resources, as it affects our own universe, the universe of self. That's one lens. The second lens is one that we called the preferred new society for which we live and labor. So this is about the, the new civilization, the forms that we're building together that are the new forms. And then the third lens places this into a much larger context, the sentient multidimensional ecosystem of the living earth. This is Gaia in all her glory. This is the planetary Logos in his full expression as he seeks to manifest his destiny and his purpose through us and through all those other lives that constitute his vehicle of expression. So these are the, the three lenses that we'll look at and look through. And we'll be using some images and just a, a few words about the images that you will be seeing. They were created back in 1975 when I was living at Findhorn and they formed part of a course which was an introduction to applied esoteric philosophy that was called esoterics, sort of a, a way of introducing people in, into the esoteric worldview without scaring them off. And so they're very simple, they're very basic, but I often find that going back to simplicity is a clearer lens than going to the complexity of, of uh, my thinking. So I'd like to begin with a key statement, and it has to do with the right circulation and flow of energy through a system. And here it says, right circulation is the hallmark of a healthy system. So right circulation of energy. And I'm reminded of a statement from esoteric healing that says, there is naught but energy for God is life. And then a little further on, it says, life will eventually be known as capable of being invoked by the soul in the interest of the form. So when we talk about the right circulation of energy, it is the life force seeking to enter into form and to carry out its purpose. So when we look at right circulation, we can look at our own particular universe of self, our physical body. Do we have any blockages? Are our arteries clean and clear? Do we have heart condition? Is the blood circulating? Or we could look at our emotional body and say, do we have certain emotional patterns and disturbances that are blocking the flow of the life force through this feeling body? And we can look at right circulation through the mental body. Have we got crystallized thoughts that are blocking the free flow of new insight and inspiration? So these are some of the questions we'll be asking as we go through this exploration together. I'll be putting forward a few thoughts. We'll have a time of reflection. And then a couple of times during our session, we'll actually be opening it up and getting input from all of us. What insights and impressions have we received so far so that our journey together is guided by ourselves? I haven't scripted the whole thing. I just had some input to stimulate the field. So when we think of free circulation, 
we're thinking of our own economy. At the moment, if you were thinking about the economic system that we have at the moment, it doesn't freely flow and touch all the parts of the system. Not all of humanity is nourished by it. So here's an example of a symptom that we can see as we look around the world. It's what I call world hunger and the split personality of our human family where some of the resources have been appropriated by a few, which causes malnourishment or undernourishment in other parts of the world. So this is a very, it's a graphic illustration of what we're seeing. And this is caused by greed, self-aggrandizement, glamour. This blocks the natural flow. So when we're caught up in these conditions, the part becomes more important than the whole. We are egocentric. And for an economy that serves all, we need to have an ecocentric perspective and an eco-friendly system of the distribution and right circulation of energy. So we can look at our own economy at the moment in the world. When people attempt to be successful as separate entities, then the parts of the system tend to compete with each other. They siphon off and hoard the resources and other parts of the human system are denied the nourishment that they need and deserve. And they enter into a slave-like relationship with an economy that seems to dictate their destiny and the conditions of their lives. So when a society becomes morally bankrupt, I believe its economic system will reflect this condition. So our present economic system is bankrupt when measured against the qualities of the soul. So the question here that's posed in this next image is, how do we invest our energy? It's easy to think of where we invest our money. More and more of us are investing in a socially responsible way. And there are so many more options now of how to invest in a positive future rather than investing in a system that is based on fear and uh, competition. So it might be useful to reflect on how am I investing my life energy at the moment? Not just where do I put my money, where are my savings, where are my investments, but truly what does it mean to invest our life energy each moment in service of the whole? So just do a little audit, a self-audit of what is my investment strategy for my life energy? What I found to be one of the greatest hindrances is the fear of loss of what I own, the fear of letting go, the fear of not having. And in this next image, it's a classic example of how we get stuck. And this one says, how to catch your monkey or the fear of letting go. And we all know the example of you have this narrow necked um, jug and inside of peanuts or coconuts, whatever it is, you can just get your hand in, but when you grab what's in the, the bottom of the jug and form a fist, you can't retrieve what's in the bottom with a clenched fist. And then we get stuck because we refuse to let go of that which we have, but we can't get that which we need and want by holding on. And this is the conundrum. So we can only have 
by letting go. It's, it's sort of um, counterintuitive. But if you think of another example of a clenched fist, a clenched fist can neither give nor receive. It's not open. So I find this image very useful whenever I get stuck and I'm afraid to let go of saying, by letting go, I actually re-enter the stream of life. And so I don't have to go and get something for myself. To the degree that I participate in the ecosystem, in the flow of life, I will be nourished. The part is nourished to the degree that it participates in the service of the whole. So let's look at some other terms that are used in finance. We talk about an economy being either in deflation or inflation. And we know that the economy simply reflects the psychological state of humanity. So let's look at some examples of what inflation and deflation might look like in the universe of self. And the top image here is a deflated self. Self-pity, lack of self-worth, we're deflated. And the way that we have self-worth and fulfillment is by having ourselves filled with the spirit of the soul of humanity, by the natural resources of the soul. However, as you can see in, in the next image, the third image, if we want to be bigger than life and larger than life and are prone to self-aggrandizement, then we tend to inflate ourselves. We are self-inflating. But that only lasts so long because if we overinflate, eventually the whole thing shatters. And so if we take these images and reflect back on our economic system, if we continue on the path of self-aggrandizement of the parts over the whole and overinflation of the parts, the whole thing will crack. A crash. And we've been told that this present economic system will pass and new, a new system will come into place. And in fact, uh, DK talks about um, the first degree initiates uh, being asked to create this new economy. So one of the great fields of service is the field of economy because it represents the right circulation of the life force. So if we think about being locked inside an economic system that doesn't nourish and is built on competition, then we become trapped. And this is part of the reason we have what DK calls prisoners of the planet. So we can ask, what is world service? Is it to patch up the old? trying to fix our old economic system, or is it to help the new grow and flourish? So just think for a moment, and we'll come back to this image later. But I want to just take us in a period of reflection now. One of the things that I like to remind myself is the statement of be like the sun, give of your warmth and light and ask for nothing in return. So this is the whole approach of not worrying about self, have no thought for the morrow. Do not worry about how you'll be taken care of put first things first, be like the sun, give of your warmth and light and ask for nothing in return. Now that's a very idealistic stance. And between that ideal and the reality that we currently live inside, there is a little bit of a gap. And there are times when we feel insecure and we need to take from the system 
There are other times when we feel more secure when we give freely. I remember my good friend David Spangler saying that the most important time to give is when you don't have anything, because by giving, you reconnect with the whole system and you reconnect with the resources of the system. One of the things I've noticed in my life is that when I'm asked to give, giving should not be conditional upon receiving. So the question is, do we have a transactional relationship with life? One that says, I'll only give if I receive. Or are we of the heart and mind that we are conduits of the life force and of the love energy? So Claire, if we could just hold that one back for a time now, and just I'll let you know when we need the next one. I just want to do a little bit more reflection on this. So if we have a transactional relationship with life, then we're always negotiating to get a good deal for ourselves. I'll give you this if I get that. So let's look at the nature of our relationship with life. Is it transactional? Is it more flowing? Remember, Christ said, I come to bring you life more abundant. So where is this abundant life? <laughs> How do we create a system where life abundant can flow? So I was thinking a lot about what it means to have this flow of resources. And a few months ago, I got a, an insight that I'd like to share with you. I was asked to present to the Findhorn community on the subject of spiritual leadership this past May. And in preparing for this presentation, I thought, well, what is spiritual leadership? Um, what would be a good analogy? What would be a good uh, image to use? And I thought, well, what about the spiritual leader as a conductor of an orchestra, helping to coordinate the various instruments so that they play in rhythm, play in harmony, play in tune? And then I thought, well, actually, it may be more accurate to say that instead of a conductor of an orchestra, the spiritual leader is a conductor of electricity. A spiritual leader is a conductor of the electric fire of will and higher purpose that is seeking to induce and impress itself on matter and create those forms that are co-resonant with the inner note. So as servers, we really are spiritual leaders. We work with conduction and induction of energy. And another thing came to mind that the word leadership itself contains the word lead. And a lead is like an energetical connection. It's an electrical wire that connects us with the higher resources. And so leadership is becoming that electrical wire, that conduit that allows for the spiritual currents to flow into humanity. So I was reflecting, how do we do this? And then it became very simple and very evident. We've been told how to do this. When we become receptive, we become the negative pole to a higher positive pole that is, if you like, a higher purpose, a greater love, then that higher purpose and greater love flows from the positive pole into the receptive field that is our consciousness. And then in turn, we face the world and we become the positive pole that transmits this resource to a world that is receptive. And we condition the field of the human psyche and we create the new conditions by receiving. So I was thinking then, when we become these leaders, this lead that connects the heaven and the earth, we become spiritually charged. 
And when we become spiritually charged, we then have to discharge these resources into the world. And that's what I mean by we're conductors. We conduct energy and we induct energy into the field. We transfer it into the field. So just think a moment. How do you relate each day? Where are you polarized? What are you receptive to? For instance, if we are receptive to a positive higher pole, then the energy from, say, spiritual hierarchy, the ashram of the Christ, whatever we name it, can flow into our lives. The energy of the soul can infuse us. However, if you look around humanity at the moment, most people are receptive to the conditioning of matter. And therefore, the gravitational pull of matter holds them as prisoners. And this for me is another way of describing the term that DK uses as prisoners of the planet. We are no longer able to reach that higher source of energy, those higher resources, and we are trapped in the gravitational field of matter. So I called this presentation Choosing the Way of Liberation and Blessing. So the way of liberation is to turn our attention and our focus to a higher purpose and a greater love and to allow it to flow into our lives so that we in turn can allow it to flow into the world. So we liberate ourselves and at the same time, we provide a blessing. And then I thought that the act of receiving and the act of giving are really not separate. And when they're simultaneous and fused as activities, then we have flow. So the right circulation and flow of divine energy can move through the human condition when we give and receive simultaneously. And I believe a lot of the problems come when we block the flow by wanting to appropriate the resources for ourselves and are not aware that these resources are the system's resources and we are the agents of distribution for these resources. They're not for the aggrandizement of the self. And it's that shift from egocentricity to ecocentricity that is so needed for a new economic model. And one final thought about this whole analogy of being a spiritual conductor of electrical energy. I thought that when we talk about being charged, what we're really being charged with is a responsibility. So the energy that we're given from the ashram is the energy to carry out the plan. It's a responsibility. So we're charged with a responsibility. And then we have to discharge our responsibility by serving in the world through our various fields of service. Then I thought about, we have financial charges. So what's a financial charge? Well, in a financial charge, we owe to the system. We have to give matter. We have to give something. But when we are charged spiritually, we receive energy in order to give it to the world in service so that we can become part of a great chain of blessing. And I'd like just to finish this part here by naming a very powerful statement to those that give, more shall be given so that they may give again. And I've had this in my awareness for many years. And each time I ponder on it, it I, I get a deeper sense of what it means. It means to the degree that we are open channels and can receive the bounty of the soul, 
and freely give it to others, more will pour through. We will grow our capacity to be of service. So the more we give, the more we are given so that we can give again. And this way, we become part of this great chain of blessing, this great chain of nourishment. And we remove ourselves out of the clutches of fear. So let's take a, a moment now just to reflect on what does it mean to be a receiver and distributor of the life force? What does it mean each day in my life? What are some of the opportunities that are available to me to play this role? So let's just take a few minutes in the silence of the group space that we've created and just reflect on how does life flow through me and from me? So I've, I've put quite a number of seeds into the, the soil of our group space here. And so what I would like to do now is, is to open it up and take the next 10 minutes for us just to share with each other what's been stimulated. What can each of us contribute to deepen this exploration that we're going through today? And you can do that by writing something in the chat and. Uh, We'll have Alexandra read that up, or you can raise your hand and you'll be given the microphone to speak. But please share into the group field any insights, impressions, they could even be questions, that stimulate further exploration of this topic, because we are inquiring the way together. So let's open it up for the next 10 minutes and then Let's see what we've harvested and use that to guide us and to give us direction for the next part of our exploration. So the field is open. Well, Alexander, are you able to see who has raised their hand and manage that? Or Claire, are you in a position to do that? So we've got this wonderful living silence at the moment. And I'm, I'm holding that this living silence is like a pregnant pause that is filled with expectancy. So whenever you have something to contribute, please do so if the technology will allow us to do that. Thank you, Michael. Is it possible to do this, to have an open sharing now, Sasha? Uh, yes, absolutely. So there is um, a function to raise your hand in your control panel. So uh, we invite 
people in the circle to share their impressions. So please use that function and raise your hand and we will unmute you so that you would be able to speak. And you can also write something in the chat if you prefer that and we can read that out. Yes, absolutely. Um, there is a comment, uh, comment from Robin. When my body feels good and well rested, I feel I can receive and give much better. If my body is exhausted, I am dim. That's very true. I know a number of us are feeling not exa well exhausted, but, but it's a long haul and we have to find the rhythm, how to serve without burning out, how to be filled with joy and to feel filled with the love of, and light of the soul and still maintain physical, emotional and mental health while being in the world, but not of it. That, that's sort of the, the big question. So what other impressions to be shared? Martin, you are muted, please. Hi, Michael. Can you hear me? Yes, Martin. Hi there. Hi. Yeah, that was wonderful. Very helpful and very clarifying. I have a question that's long concerned me. We're in transition from a crumbling kind of economic system into the potential you described so beautifully and effectively. I just would like some comment about, is it necessary for there to be a breakdown, to be the, for there to be a collective breakthrough? In other words, certain forces have their, in their grasp the, the reins of the current dying civilization. What, how do we get there from here? And if you know what I'm saying. I do. So it goes back to that, Claire, if you could put that slide up of, of world service, where do, are we there to patch up the old? Okay, so let me start with this, Martin. Um, is the present system redeemable? Now, can you patch up the form or is the, the core of it healthy? Is it sound? Is it built on the principles of the soul? If it isn't, it basically can't be saved and shouldn't be saved. So I'm thinking when DK talks about every time there is a note of will sounded on the planet, he talks about the three effects of Shambhala. So Shambhala, the note of Shambhala, the note of, of this higher will when it sounded, will either strengthen those forms and organize them that are resonant with the note. It will just make them stronger and, and greater vehicles of service. It will purify those forms that are slightly out of alignment. It will put us through a, a catharsis. It will shake us and bring us into alignment. And a, a number of us, I believe, experience that on a daily basis. We ask to be in line with a higher purpose and a higher will and it recalibrates us it shakes us up and then dk said the third effect of shambhala is destruction where the form no longer can serve the indwelling life and i believe that gaia um, if you want to call gaia or the planetary logos if, if you want to use that terminology is sounding or a sounding a new note. It's a note of a higher frequency because the planet itself is going through its own evolution. It is shifting. It is going through an initiation. And remember, initiation is simply a greater capacity to carry out the will of God. So whether we're talking about a human being or a planet, initiation simply means we grow a greater capacity to carry out the will of God. So back to your question, Martin, I do, I personally don't think the present system, when it's asked to carry out the next phase of the will of God, can be responsive in the way that is needed. What we have at the moment are these new shoots, these new green economy coming up, 
we have the blue economy, we have all these new colors of the economy, which are aimed at creating a system based on, if you like, the qualities of the soul. And so I, I believe that we will be experiencing in the next year a further destruction of some of the systems that have held us at the, uh, at the moment, whether these be social systems, economic systems, climate systems, we know have already broken their banks. We know that the, um, the climate has gone beyond the former levels of tolerance and we are living in worlds of extreme. So if we look at uh, the global warming and climate change, we can see that this system has been affected by the psyche of humanity. And so it is the psyche of humanity that creates the economic system. It isn't a natural system. The natural system is the flow and circulation of the life force throughout creation. And we humans have created our own version of that system to circulate energy in the form of money. And because there's greed, and because the self-aggrandizement, we've created a system that really isn't fair. And here's a thought. I remember reading in the Agni Yoga book community, um, Master M says, the first thing to go in the new civilization will be private property. <laughs> and I know that that sort of really stirred up a conversation. What do you mean private property? He basically said, we don't need it, it will com be communal. And people say, well, that sounds like a communist uh, approach. But if you look at it in spiritual terms, in the new civilization, we have to create systems that allow for the free flow and circulation of the life force in whatever form it takes, whether that be money, that be anything, that be love, that be respect. And so uh, that's a sort of a long, convoluted answer to your question. I'm not sure if I addressed it, but um, that's what was prompted by it. Well, thank you, I will ponder on this. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> ponder on that. <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> so any other impressions or contributions, insights to add to the field? Is there Hi, Michael. a number of yeah. hands uh, raised? Yeah, go ahead, Michael. Yes, um, Michael, thank you very much for this marvelous presentation so far. I expect it will continue as such. Uh, something that I have been pondering for a long time is the difference between giving and sharing. Um, you know, the, the Tibetan talks about sharing is something that must be implemented for the return of the, the teacher. And there seems to me to be a slight difference between the two. And you yes. know, that's, something, that's something to discuss. Um, and you know, I agree with you that the system is broken. Uh, and we as humanity can either uh, continue as we have been and it will be destroyed and everyone will hurt, or there can be some kind of bridge built between the old and the new. Right, right. Thank you. Uh, I, I like your distinction between giving and sharing. And what came to me as you were speaking was that giving seems to be, I'll give to a specific, I give to something, where sharing is my whole hearted engagement in life. It's sharing, I fill the system, I fill the sphere with, with who I am and what I receive and the, the resources. Because the soul is resourceful, because it is the source. I, I go back to that statement, be like the sun, give and ask for nothing in return. And, and, and so I, I, I really like this distinction that you've introduced between giving and sharing. And I certainly, as Martin said, I'm going to ponder this more, but my immediate response is sharing is, 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 is more multidimensional than just giving. It seems to fill the whole sphere, while as giving will satisfy a part of the, a point. I mean, yeah, that, it, it, it seems like 
uh, for so many of us, giving is, well, I'll give this to someone who, who appears to be in need of something, and it makes me feel good, right? Yes, got it. <laughs> and, and, yeah. and that's not what giving should be about. And, and giving shouldn't be one-sided. Right. Thank you. Um, what we're talking about here is unconditional giving, unconditional love, uh, other than uh, as opposed to conditional giving. I'll give this because there's a return, something in it for me. I like to feel good about giving. I think what the Tibetan is talking about is that where we simply share the life that moves through us um, and we enhance it. Remember the difference between energy and force. Energy enters and is conditioned by a consciousness and becomes a force. So in order for us to become a force for good in the world, we have to allow the energy of love or a greater love to flow through us out into the world. And that for me is we share ourselves in that way. So for me, you've helped me understand that sharing is unconditional love and, and giving can be more conditional or has there's a tendency or, or a, a danger of that. So I appreciate the clarification that you put on that. Yeah, there may be others, but this is this is the one that you helped me get to. So thank you. Appreciate it. OK. Any, any other contributions? We'll take a few more minutes and then we'll we'll continue for to inquire the way together. I am muted. Michael, yeah. ah. Hi there. Who's speaking? Uh, Claire, you wanted to say something, and I also unmuted Richard Hood, but that probably Rebecca, or both. Um, so shall I go quickly and then um, pass the mic on? Is that all right? Yeah, let's spread the word. Okay. Yeah, so I just wanted to uh, mention the title of a book called The Gift, which is written by Lewis Hyde. And in it, he discusses um, much of what um, we're pondering this morning, um, specifically the difference between commodity and gift, and mm -hmm. the fact that the life of a gift depends on its circulation. And you've um, used the word flow, Michael, um, me, um, several times through your, your offering this morning, and it feels like a very key word in terms of the well-being of the system. Um, yes. So, yeah, just wanted to recommend that book, um, The Gift by Lewis Hyde. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Michael. This is Sheldon. Oh, hi, Sheldon. How are you doing? Good. Thank you. Thank you. Marvelous presentation. I just had an immediate thought as you, as we broke into this um, this particular section of, of, of sharing, um, of what we've seen in the last four or five days since um, since September 21st or thereabouts, the Day of Peace. You know, all the different kind of peace activities that, that were that you see online, you see offered up enormous kind of expression through Pathways to Peace, Cultures of Peace, Unify, the United Nations. Um, I just felt um, kind of touching into what, what people aspire to it and want to see happen. But the, the lift from that on a, on a larger scale was, was, has been immensely powerful. And I um, just wanted to share that immediately as, as, a, as an example, I think, of, um, of what can happen and how big uh, this this movement for for um, peace movement, citizens movement, you know, on, on a global scale has become. Yes. Thanks, Sheldon. It's interesting to note that when we talk about peace, it isn't just the cessation of war or strife. Exactly. Exactly. Um, the, the Shambhala, the center where the will of God is known, is also known as the center of true peace. And the peace that passeth all understanding is that total alignment with a higher will, a higher purpose, where there is absolute, complete 
alignment with deeper meaning and therefore we are at peace um, thank you there, there is there are a couple of people who have um, contributed to the chat here and I just want if, if can you read those uh, Sasha or can I can I access that I'm trying to um, um, I'm reposting those uh, sharings now in the, in the uh, chat that everyone could read them. They've okay, so that everyone can read them. We don't have to re read them out. But, so please go to the chat box and read. There's, a, there's a, some wonderful contributions there. Because yeah, this is very real. This, we're being asked to do this. We're being asked to become this channel for the free flow of the life energy. And, and there, there comes a time, I guess, when we realize that together we represent integral, integral aspects of life. And it's like through an act of will, we declare, I choose to wholeheartedly participate in life, to play my part in the plan that is the outworking of the sacred destiny of earth or whatever statement we make. There comes a time when we declare that we are part of the planetary life. We're not observers. We're not on the outside looking in. We're not here to survive. Our task is to participate as agents of thrival, not survival. So as we have this particular image on the screen at the moment, what is world service? Is it to patch up the old or to grow the new? Of course, it's a bit of both. And, and what I've said is, as disciples, our task is twofold. One, it's to build the new civilization through the construction of the bridge of light and love, the Antikarana, between the fourth and fifth kingdoms, hum humanity and hierarchy, and to embody the laws and principles of the kingdom of souls while containing the pain and sorrow of a suffering and dying world in the compassionate chalice of the heart. So it isn't that we turn our back on the world, we turn our back on the forms but we don't turn our back on the suffering. And we, we hold in our hearts the suffering. And we, we all know that the ability to hold the suffering is a hallmark of the great redeemers, the Buddha and the Christ. And yet their gift is to bring new life. Behold, I come to bring you new life, life more abundant. And we've been enlisted in this. We've been asked as the new group of world service to be spiritual leaders, to show up and be part of the manifestation of the plan. And we're being asked to do it on a daily basis. <laughs> we've got to figure out what does it mean? So I go back to being a server, being a member of the new group of world service is actually being a spiritual leader a lead that connects the fourth and the fifth kingdoms. And we've been told that the, the connection between the fourth and the fifth will grow closer and closer and eventually fuse in the same way that our soul and our personality is a desired fusion so that we can then create an even more powerful chalice to receive the outpouring of the monadic fire, the electrical fire of life. And so the coming closer of the fourth and fifth kingdoms is a requisite for the planet becoming sacred for the reappearance of the Christ. Uh, I've mentioned this before, but I believe that the externalization of the hierarchy and the reappearance, the externalization of the hierarchy begins with the internalization of the hierarchy. Each of us needs to internalize the qualities of the soul. And as we live them, we raise our frequency. We are governed by, we know, the law of group progress. DK makes very clear the law of group progress is about group consciousness. It's not about the development of, of the individual. And the esoteric name for the law of group progress is the law of elevation. So we're being asked to elevate, and this is what Sheldon was saying, things are being elevated, there's a lift to things. And I believe that we are being governed and we are part of this great uh, law of group progress. And if, if you look at Libra, where we are at the moment, and look at what um, 
the Tibetan refers to in Libra as the opportunity. And Claire, we, we can just remove this image at the moment and if, if you'd be so kind and go into reflective mode. The Tibetan talks about Libra in the following way. He says, there is therefore the individual experience in Libra of the balanced life wherein experiment is made and the consequent tipping of the scales in one direction or another until either desire or spiritual aspiration weighs the balance down sufficiently so as to indicate the way that the man must go at the time. So we're in the scales and we can tip it either way, whether we become receptive to matter or receptive to spirit. And then he goes on to say, there is the experience of humanity in Libra in which the same adjustments and experiments are being made. But this time, the entire race of humanity, of human beings is involved and not just the individual. Of this, the point of crisis in Libra and the present world situation and needed adjustments is the forerunner. We know that we're in the age of the forerunner. And so we're helping to make these adjustments. We are helping to free the prisoners of the planet by liberating ourselves from the gravitational pull of matter, by becoming receptive to the higher positive pole of hierarchy. And it's, it's a very powerful time. And there is an image, I think the final image, or there are two more images, but uh, Claire, if you could show the next image, please. So we, we know this one about polar, polarization. And those of you who have studied psychosynthesis know Roberto Asagioli's uh, approach to the resolution of the opposites. So the Tibetan says, first we have a polarized field, and then there's tension between the poles. And this builds up to a point of crisis. Now, a crisis really is another name for um, an unresolved or an unredeemed polarity. And then this crisis builds to a point where it either collapses of the field or we aspire and it sweeps us upwards to a higher point of focus. And that becomes the baseline and the foundation for the next polarized field and so on and so on. So it's how we move through polarization, tension, crisis, sweep. And if we look at Libra as the sign in which we choose the way that leads between the two great lights of force, there is a hint there of what Libra offers us. And once this, again, it says leads, so we go back to this whole notion of a lead. When we connect our life with the life of the ashram, we are not only led, but we become leaders. We become leads through which the grace and the love and the light of the Christ can flow. And so choosing the higher way once again, we're charged with the responsibility to carry out our part of the divine plan. And when we assume responsibility, we receive the power and the resources to carry out the work. So we've been charged and then we need to discharge the energetic assignment that we've been given, which is our part in the one work. So we could say that as we walk the path of liberation and blessing, we are being asked to connect with a higher source and then to transmit that energy into the world to free the prisoners of the planet. For me, I, I attempt to keep it that simple because it gets too complex. It, it, to what degree can I hold my alignment and my focus each moment to the higher so that it flows into my life and I in turn and to distribute the life force to the world around me. Now that's, that's a, I say a tall order, <laughs> but it's one that we need to practice. And we need to practice it together. 
because the new group of world servers is being asked to provide spiritual leadership and to be the connection between hierarchy and humanity. We're told that we are the intermediary. We, as the new group of world servers, are the Ajna center, where energy is directed. And it helps the, the flow between humanity, the throat center, hierarchy, the heart center, and Shambhala, the head center. And this is the upper triangle of the planet that's wanting to be activated. So you can take these esoteric concepts and bring them down into really simple daily practices. How can the love of the soul flow through me into every encounter, every action? So let's stop for a, a while and just reflect on this question. What does it mean for me to be a spiritual leader each day? How do I go about this task? What does it mean for me to be a spiritual leader? So just allow those impressions to register in your heart, in your mind, and to inform you and to guide us. We know that we're at a crucial stage in evolution, and we know that DK says a closer cooperation has to exist between the fourth and the fifth kingdoms. And so we're being asked to enter a spiritual partnership with our elder brothers and sisters in the kingdom of souls or the spiritual hierarchy or the communion of saints, whatever name we want to give to it. Not for our own spiritual development, but so that we can be part of a great chain of blessing. A great chain of blessing that is the circulatory system of the planet for the distribution of the life force. Um, and it's not how big and how grand we do this. It's how we do this with the fullness of our hearts. It's the small acts of kindness that add up and create a point of precipitation where this greater love is manifest on the earth where the conditions are created for the reappearance of the Christ. So before we conclude with a meditation, I'd like to open it up again for another, say, 10 minutes, just to us to share our impressions of what are we sitting with now? What's alive in our hearts and minds as a result of being together in the sacred space and of listening to the call because that's really what it's about. We're being called to service and we're responding in the best way we can. And we need to help each other because this is a group endeavor. And the law of group progress says it is about the creation of group consciousness as an act of service. So let's open the field up again, either for you to write something in the chat box or to speak something into the field. And then we'll conclude our time together with a meditation. I'm, I, I'm unmuted, uh, Katya. Yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Michael. It's, um, it's interesting there, I would say, 
three things that came to mind. First is uh, the line from all the beacon. Evil is good that should have been left behind. Mm, beautiful. And uh, what's the way that DK is offering to leave things behind? He urges us to not to fight the old forms, but to create new ones and yes. direct our energy towards the new one. And I was amazed when I read the book on uh, neurology of human brain um, about the people who actually did overcome their, some serious addictions, like and change their lives in a way that a lot of us want, but kind of don't master that. So they were studied by the group of <clears throat> scientific uh, scientists. And the main thing about that was that they had this new neurological paths, neuron paths. Mm. And not that the old were gone, they were there. And they, when those people were tempted with the old uh, favors, so to speak, those neural paths would lit up, but the new ones were actually stronger. So it is, and I, when I read that, I thought, oh my God, is this, is this that, uh, oh, like, direct? Mm -hmm. That notion about the new path, supporting the new path. So it's even in our brain. If we yes. support the new path, it well, will become uh, stronger and we won't have to worry. Well, thank you, Katja, because that, if you take that to the next dimension, the one of the, the, the larger interdimensional ecosystem, the planetary Logos is creating new pathways. And yes. we, we are the, as Teilhard de Chardin says, we are the, the newer sphere, the higher mind of the planet that bridges between the ideal and the real. And, and, and so these new pathways are these new channels for the life force to flow into the world. Thank you. That that's that's a wonderful input. Are there are there any if I were to if I yes. I'm sorry, can I can I say another thing? Oh, because I think it's relevant. You know, uh, when um DK talks about the conditions for Christ's return, right? Yes. He talks about acknowledging uh the existence of etheric plane, right? Etheric body. And uh, I, all of a sudden, it just hit me that because if you would love to share that force, that life force, it shares through your body. That's who we are. That's why we share because we share something which we are, not what we have. Yes. But we can probably be giving. But what we are, and therefore this that that's how sharing. <laughs> becomes <clears throat> like that electric current, as you said, because those um, electrons, they just vibrate. They don't move anywhere. They're just yeah. in place. They're vibrating, right? And therefore, sharing that condition throughout the network. Thank and, you, uh, because... It, it, it's because... just changing. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Michael. I just, no, no, I, I think it's, it's wonderful. Sit by the inspiration and how much people are probably too excited. Um, so the phrase also that came to mind, and then I give you all the uh, raising the dead body of humanity. Right. And that's etheric body. And that's what we need to change from old to the new, from material, from um, elemental to etheric. That's it. All done. Over to you. Well, no, thank you. I, I appreciate it. And, and the, the, <clears throat> the microphone was cutting in and out, so I wasn't quite sure when you were finished. So I apologize if I interrupted. Uh, I think what you point out is that this move to etheric living says that the earth itself is refining its body and we're being asked to raise our vibration in order to be part of the evolving life of the planet. That's it. The whole thing's being raised. For instance, was it, it was 
it wasn't so long ago that we were told that the hierarchy lived on the higher mental plane. And then they, then they moved house and they moved to the buddhic plane. I guess there's a better view from the buddhic plane, you know, it's better real estate. But anyway, uh, the vibration is different and we, we are being asked to raise our vibration. And that is why we're being asked to work with the fifth kingdom, with the kingdom of souls, because that is our true home. And so what we're doing with the etheric bridge that we're building between is, is to create this field of resonance so that there is a field in which this Christ energy can precipitate. So I, I thank you, Katya, for, for, for bringing that awareness. Um, why don't we take one more input because I know we have to finish in about eight, 15 minutes and I, I want to take us through a meditation, but is there anyone else that would like to contribute by speaking? Um, in addition to writing something in the chat. Uh, Deborah? Yes, hello. hello. Hi there. Thank you, Michael and everyone. Um, this is such a great uh, webinar. There's so much to it. And truly, I think that um, the, the group work, not just with the seed groups, but the broader groups of light workers everywhere is really creating not just a line of light, but a culvert, a huge channel, a big river, or some of the images that come to me too are like a gigantic um, uh, acupuncture needle for right. the earth, you know, or a series or a column of acupuncture needles, you know, stimulating the new life and um, and so forth. I wanted to bring forward um the work i don't know if you're familiar with the work of michael tellinger doing what he calls ubuntu um he's he's in south africa but he has this model that he calls one small town where it it's a system that is designed to take a small town that has basic autonomy you know locally and first transform the energy grid and then create a complete economy on what people want to contribute. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's a remarkable model that is actually being taken up in Canada right now. I believe in Ontario, uh, a, a small town in Ontario, the mayor has signed on, the city council signed on. And this is a remarkable experiment because oh, I wow. think I think we need to shift just in terms of practical um, economics, right? We have to shift away from these mega corporations, international, mm -hmm. you know, conglomerates that really um, do want to, you know, consolidate their power over everything that lives and so forth. Um, to to make it local, but it, it it seems to be very practical theoretically, and they're trying it on the ground, and that reminds me of another statement of the Tibetan in um, the Libra, I believe, chapter of esoteric astrology, where he's saying, you know, <clears throat> sometimes spiritual people when they want to go ahead and finance a project or you know a needed service. Um, you find that they don't have the funds because they are working from too high a level that uh, that that you know the, that issues of monetary resources are strictly a third ray activity mm -hmm. um, and he says what you need to do is be so practical that you actually bring together two tangibles to get that right down onto the ground, you know, on the physical plane. And so I wanted to kind of um, kind of balance it that way too, because we really do need to be a bridge between the highest that we as a group globally can possibly manage, you know, in terms of bringing in new intensity and, and so forth, but also the importance of grounding and then when we do want to bring it down to the ground, that we remember that principle of bring together two tangibles, you know? Yes, um, yes. And so I, I did want to kind of throw that out. 
since I have Libra rising to balance the day. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Thank you. <laughs> the discussion. But, 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 but I want to just share one other thing, which I think. But could you also uh, could you also write in the chat um, the the reference uh, of of this the experiment that you talked about earlier? So just just. Oh make yes. Um, with the people. How do we but do we, that? Um, well, you just we, write, or you can send an email to 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 the um, webinar. But anyway. Why don't you just say what you need to say before um, going to meditation? Okay. You know, one of the shifts I really think about all of this a lot that I think we need to make is and, and is being demonstrated by these experiences experiments in Ubuntu is that the current frame, you know, of of capitalism, corporatism you know, that we're dealing with, especially in the US, um, is, is that it, it it's, insists that you monetize your life. Yes. You monetize yes. your life purpose. Okay, so if you're a writer, you have to figure out how to monetize that. You've <laughs> got to get into marketing and monetizing. And uh, I think the frame that we are here and our purpose is to monetize our life is a serious serious illusion <laughs> that i would really love to see us um dissolve thank you thank yeah. you thank you appreciate that input and and um claire could i ask you to put up that final slide with the with the, the planet number eight if you could we could end with so this is what we're facing, and it's yeah. been described. It's what we see around us. The world is now passing through its own shadow. The darkness represents the sum total of all the unresolved thoughts and actions of humanity. Mm. We're meeting our own planetary dweller. This is, this is what's happening at the moment. And so we're tasked with bringing in the light, creating these new pathways of light, what Katcher alluded to about the neural pathways, we are creating, if you like, the planetary neural pathways where love can flow. And so what I want to do in our closing meditation is to actually create these new pathways together and to distribute the energy and to circulate the energy that is seeking to move through humanity and to nourish this planet as it evolves and takes its place within its greater family, which is the solar family. So I, I, there are probably more people that want to speak and there are more things to be shared. Um, I want to also honor the fact that we will be finishing in about 12 minutes. And because this is the, Lib the Libra full moon, I, I want to, for us to avail ourselves of this opportunity and to use this time because we know the full moon is set aside for closer contact with the ashram. And uh, we're here together, so what better time than now to do that together? So let us take a deep breath. Give gratitude to each other for being present. Allow all the impressions and the thoughts that have been circulating to begin a process of assimilation. And let us allow them to flow and circulate through our own universe of self, our own ecosystem, so that they continue to feed us in the coming days and weeks. Let's bring ourselves to a point of stillness within the heart. And at the center of the heart, both sense and visualize a flame. This is the flame of the fire of love that burns in the heart of each human being. And we connect heart to heart to heart in this group. 
to create a loving, receptive field that is the group heart. And through an act of love and an act of gratitude, we bring ourselves into communion with the higher positive pole that we know as the presence of greater love. This is the presence of the Christ. And as we rise in love together, let us stand at one with the Christ in the fire of love. We are filled with this greater love. And those of us gathered today are part of a vast network of service that spans the world that we call the new group of world servers. So let us both visualize and sense the etheric heart of the new group of world servers pulsing with the presence of the Christ. And we share this love with our world. So visualize ourselves turning outward to face the world. And from the heart of our group, we send blessings of love into the world to condition the field of human consciousness to prepare the way. We see these waves of love touching the hearts and minds of people everywhere, awakening them to the reality of the three principles of the kingdom of the soul, essential divinity, goodwill, and unanimity. And we raise our hands in blessing. And from the heart of our group, 
we send forth unconditional love. Blessings to all beings, north, south, east, west, above, below. Blessings to all beings. And we send our gratitude to our elder brothers and sisters in the ashram who hold us in unconditional love 24 seven. And we rededicate ourselves to the service of the coming one. May we create that pathway that Christ has asked us to create, a pathway of light and love. So that the Christ within the heart of each human being can germinate and begin to flower. And that radiant presence that is the embodiment of love may return to earth. So we've been spiritually charged and now we have to discharge our responsibility through an act of love, through an act of sharing. This is the new economy. So be it. So this completes our journey together, but we've got much more to do together. <laughs> this is just an interlude. The work continues and hopefully the bonds continue to be strengthened between us and among us so that we can tread this path together as one unified group. Thank you for this time. And if there are any announcements that needed to be made at the, at the end, Sasha, please do so. We got one minute left. Yes, there are always announcements to share further. It's, it's, it's field of silence is important, but it's difficult to step in. Given force the charge that we received forwards to the world. So 
Let's invite you to reconvene the coming New Moon webinar where we'll continue our work focusing on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And in the New Moon of Libra, we will bring our focus to goal number nine, infrastructure, industry, and innovations. And that would be on October 9th. And our coming Scorpio Solar Festival webinar, we will focus on the C group of trained observers. And Yves Chumet from France will share the experience of decades of work of his group in this field. Thank you everyone for joining us today and as we continue our journey into the energy of Libra. Let's stay connected. Namaste. And Michael, thank you for your beautiful presentation and facilitation of discussion in today's group. Blessings, everyone. Take care.